I'm Marcy Sutton, and I'm here to open your minds to some different ways that people navigate the web. Because too often, when we're designing and building software, we design it for ourselves, and we don't look outside of our own abilities. And so I want to highlight some ways that we can innovate software for people with disabilities along with everyone else. So I'm Marcy. I work on accessibility tools at DQ, and I work remotely from up in Bellingham, Washington. You can find these slides online at marcysutton.com slash fluent17, and you can find me anytime on Twitter at Marcy Sutton. So the first person or first group of people I want to call your attention to are people with physical disabilities, people who are in wheelchairs, uh, much like Stephen Hawking. He's kind of a famous uh, wheelchair user. So I recently became acquainted with a guy named Ian McKay, and he's from Washington State. Um, last summer, he did this really cool ride called Ian's Ride, where he rode in his mechanical wheelchair from Anacortes, Washington, to Portland, Oregon. And the goal was to raise awareness about accessible trails and the need for them. And in this photo from Ian's ride, he's with his buddy Todd, and they're in their wheelchairs. They have mobile devices attached to the wheelchair that they can use to both power the wheelchair and get around um, navigating with maps and communicating with friends. And they both use a device that's called a sip and puff. And that is how they uh, interact with their chair, because they are both paralyzed from the neck down. So the way that they would interact with the web is quite different than how you would if you had use of your arms and legs. And so this group of people is pretty important to consider. People with vision impairments, uh, like my coworker Steve Sawson, he's fully blind, as well as Laura Legendary, who's standing off to the left of this photograph, they're both blind, and they're both accessibility professionals. So for people with vision impairments, either blind from birth or if you have degenerative vision loss or even color blindness, how you interact with the web is a little different. Um, if you're blind, you might use a screen reader. And the web can be a great equalizer. It can help people gain employment with a disability, and it's just hugely important. And in this photo, we were doing some tandem bicycling, which was one of the highlights of my career. For people with hearing impairments, who are either born deaf or have degenerative hearing loss, um, a big equal uh, a way to make the web an equal platform is to provide captions and text alternatives. So I have a caption on a video where I was introducing Rebecca Murphy in a bear suit, and it made for some pretty funny captions later. So that's really important to consider to uh, help people with hearing impairments still consume media content. And then lastly, there's this group of people with cognitive disabilities. And this is a pretty broad category. Um, one person that I have on the screen is Jamie Knight, and he works at the BBC. And he has such a unique perspective to the web, and he does really great work at the BBC. In this article for Disability Horizons, he talks about what it's like to be an autistic software developer, um, how he can sometimes get overwhelmed by sounds and sights. Um, he has his buddy Lion, and that's a plushie that he carries around to be something stable that he can actually hang on to when things get rough. Um, and so how he interacts with the web is different. And all of this to say that people with disabilities make up about a fifth of the population, it, roughly speaking. It's pretty broad um, categories of people, and some people have multiple disabilities. But when you think about it, that's more people than use, for example, an old version of Internet Explorer. So when we're chasing down these bugs for one browser, uh, we should probably be putting accessibility as a higher priority because of all the people that it can impact. So as technologists, I think a lot of us here are engineers and software developers. And I want you to come away from this knowing that it's not only our responsibility, it's really a team effort to think about accessibility because it starts with user experience. So as a developer, there's things that we can do, but we need to get friendly and comfortable with our design and UX team so that we can produce the most well-designed, accessible things we can together. But as technologists, um, as a pragmatic approach to accessibility, you can think of it, of it as software quality. And so you want to produce really high quality software, therefore it should be accessible. And I know that can be uh, a challenge sometimes, um, but there's some real basics that get forgotten. So that's what I want you to remember. Um, and I'll give you some resources at the end. 
So if you really want to dig in more to the technical side of accessibility, a little plug for my talk tomorrow here at Fluent. I'm talking about accessibility testing and continuous integration, which is a really great way to integrate accessibility if you're brand new to it. Maybe you need to learn about some tools. So you can come to my talk tomorrow afternoon at 3.35. So you might be thinking, oh, this accessibility thing, that means that websites are boring and they all look the same. Well. That is not true. Websites don't have to be boring to be accessible. There's so many examples. One of my favorites is from Simply Accessible, which is an accessibility company. They rebranded a few years ago, and their website is just beautiful. It's well architected, so all the content is really easy to digest. Um, their brand is really memorable and recognizable. It's accessible. Um, and they have these really cute illustrations that sort of tie it all together. And so they are doing something really well there. Another example is uh, a few iterations ago of the Target corporate website that I got to work on. And working on this site was really cool because Target's brand is so recognizable and fun to work with. And this site, I got to uh, prototype accessibility and responsive design together early in the process. And it made it really successful. Because every interaction, I got to play with the ramifications of accessibility and responsive design together so that then it could be highly interactive. Um, and so it doesn't have to be boring at all. But the earlier you start, the better. So accessibility can be super cutting edge at the same time. Like It doesn't have to be a static website in the traditional sense with full page refreshes and things. So I'm going to play a video for you of uh, an education platform um, by Blackboard where it's a super modern JavaScript heavy application with layers, and they've managed accessibility really well. So I want to show you what that looks like and sounds like. Because as for education in particular, people with disabilities need to get an education, just like everyone else. They need to get jobs, just like everyone else, and have those opportunities. So for these platforms, it's critical that they be accessible. Ten. You are currently on HTML content. To enter the web area, press Control, Option, Shift, Down Arrow. Link. Skip to main content. Complimentary three items. Heading level one. Courses. Banner two items. Courses filter. Pop-up button. Current courses, selected, button main courses, one item, link, meeting management. You are currently on a link, heading level one, meeting management, banner two items, link, skip to main content, main course visited, link, content, navigation main one item, link, calendar, link, discussions, link, link, messages, menu pop-up link, roster view everyone in your course, complimentary six items, courses open students can access this course, pop-up button, join session, pop-up button, more options for collaborate, pop-up button, link, Books and tools. Main for more options for course content. Pop up button. Add new content above new document. Collapse button. Add new content above new document. Expand it button. Visited link. Create. You are heading level one. Create item. Banner one item. Course content items. Selected expanded. Tab main courses one item. You are link. Folder. Visited link. Document. New document. Edit text. You are currently on a text field. To enter text in this field, type. Capital A E L F up space L U E N T space L F exclaim, conf. Hello fluent conf selected. All right, so that's a screen reader. If you've never seen one operating before, that is VoiceOver, which if you have a Mac or an iPhone, you have a screen reader. If you have an Android device, you have a screen reader in your pocket. And what I really like about Blackboard's application is that even though they have these layers opening on top, they send your focus to that new layer uh, for a few reasons. One, so it, it's announced in a screen reader. And two, so that your keyboard focus is in the right part of the app. You're not stuck on a previous layer. They also did a really good job of labeling their icon buttons. Although, admittedly, they could probably benefit from some text labels under those icons. At the very least, for a screen reader user, an icon button explained what it was for, like a calendar. And then further, they had similar icon buttons where they had multiple instances of the same icon, but they did different things. And they were all labeled uniquely, so that a screen reader user would be able to tell one settings button from another. And when I added new content, there was a little plus button. And it, it told you where you were in the, the hierarchy of documents. It would say, add new content above new document. So it was sort of spatially aware when they used templating to create this application. They're actually looking at the content around it to make it usable and actually intuitive to someone with a screen reader. 
So something else I want you to consider is that not everyone uses a mouse. There's so many inputs, and I'm going to show you a few examples. Uh, one image I have is from a 3D table that I worked in an agency. They had one of these, um, and it has so many inputs. For instance, you could touch it. You could put physical objects on it and turn them around to do things. You could wave your hand and do a 3D gesture. You could use a mobile device or speech uh, with the keyboard. You could uh, do things with just the keyboard and not a mouse or a trackpad. So I want you to expand your mind past just the mouse or just uh, being able to touch your, your mobile device. Using dictation, I use that all the time. And it's so freeing. Technology has these capabilities that we could be supporting other inputs in our websites and applications. Just a few weeks ago at Web Rebels in Oslo, Charlie Gerard from the New York Times gave a really interesting talk about mind control with JavaScript. And she was working on a framework called Epoch.js for the emotive, and it had this brain analyzer, uh, this like connections on her mind that could pick up her facial movements. Um, and I think the goal is to do mind control with JavaScript. Admittedly, it was a pretty new piece of technology. Um, and so there were some interesting challenges there. But that has huge implications for assistive devices, to be able to use your mind or just your fac facial movements to control JavaScript. Super cool. So I'm going to attempt to do something a little risky here. I'm going to show you a, a device that already exists. So the emotive is something brand new. That's kind of the future. Um, but we have really futuristic technology right now. So I'm going to show you switch access. If I can get my phone to pick up my face, this was happening earlier. Um, so the idea is that you can scan the web page. And it, it, since you, you might not have the motor control or dexterity to touch it in the you know, swipe or touch it in the same way that someone else might, um, you can use a switch control to access each of these parts of the, the document. Demo gods are not blessing me today. OK, so no go on the QuickTime. That's what videos are for. So I'm going to show you a demo of um, my phone recorded. It's a very similar interface. Um, this is switch access on iOS using what's called point scanning. Um, so I'm going to let it play, and I'll describe what's happening. So the point scanner is one type of switch control. And it has these lines that you tap every time you want it to select something. And then I turn my head to the right to select. Um, so what I'm doing is going into a contact form with switch access um, and waiting for the lines to go over th this perfect spot on an input field. Oh, right now I'm getting a dictation button. So then I can say, I can say my name. So I can use a combination of switch access and dictation to actually fill this in uh, theoretically hands-free. You could be using a sip and puff. You could be using uh, a single button on a keyboard. Um, and sort of prior art is Stephen Hawking's assistive technology. So that's how my buddy Ian McKay and Todd Stable felt. Like that's how they would interact with the web, is using switch access. So that's really cool. So to recap. Accessibility impacts all of us. You might not think, well, no, that's not me, or that's not my customer. I want you to challenge that assumption and look beyond at you in 15 years, or your parents, or your customers. Like, it's very personal, and it can impact any of us at any time. Um, Ian got injured in a cycling accident. That hits close to home to me, because I'm a big cyclist. So it can change in an instant. And accessibility is something we can pay attention to now um, for that future self or future customer. It starts with UX, so it's a team effort. It's not just on development. But in the development portion, it is about software quality. So we should treat it as you know, defects that we need to address. It doesn't have to be boring, as we saw. There's a lot of futuristic um, applications for accessibility. And the best part is you can start now. So don't feel bad if you haven't thought about it before. You can start today. Um, and I have a talk tomorrow. You can come and learn more. So I've got some slides and my resources, or some resources in my slides. Um, you can go and find those online, including how to use switch access. So thanks so much, Fluent.